Well, one of the unique parts about my job is that I get to perform weddings. I get to marry people, and I actually don't do them very often anymore, but there was a time years ago where, no kidding, I did a wedding virtually every single weekend. One, one weekend I'll never forget, in less than 24 hours, I married three different couples. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget being terrified that I was going to say the wrong name, and so what I did in each of my sets of notes, I wrote the name of the bride and groom and the last name as large as I possibly could. Again, I was, I was terrified. But before I do any wedding, I, I meet with the couple. We walk through pre-marriage mentoring and what that looks like, counseling. We talk about the service itself, which uh, brings up the wedding vows. Now, wedding vows are fairly standard, right? They've been around. They're pretty much the same things for a long, long time. But about 5 or 10% of the time, the couple will say to me, hey, Adam, we, we, kinda, we like the tradition vows, and yet we kind of want to write our, our own. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Uh, if it's okay, I'd just like to read through the vows before the service, if that's, that's all right. Now, just to say it, marriage vows, even the traditional ones to start, are fairly lofty. Like, they're fairly lofty vows. Like, I promise to love and comfort you in sickness or in health, for better or worse, richer or poorer, till we are parted by death. And every time I read those vows, I'm like, why would you ever want to sign up for something so horrible? Like, that's just, like, that's a long, long time. And those are pretty big vows. But when a couple decides to write their own vows, I'm just kind of saying they take it to a completely different level, okay? Like you can't believe some of the vows that I've seen. Like I, I promise to never argue with you only to love you. Yeah, that's never gonna happen, okay? That's never, and I, I promise to be the air that you can breathe. What does that even mean? Not to mention a few weeks in when you find out your spouse farts a lot in bed and it's just kind of like, that's just really kind of nasty. Or I promise to never hinder you, but to only let you fly. It's like, uh, you better be a pilot and you better make some money because we got some bills to pay if you're doing flying or whatever. But, but the most outlandish vows that I hear time and time again have three words, simple words, you complete me, you complete me, which is the name of our new series that we're starting today again, you complete me. Now, before we continue on, I just want to say welcome. Just welcome at all of our campuses and network churches. I can't say it strongly enough. We're so excited you've decided to come and worship with us here today. My name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here. And truly, we've been praying that you would come. Whether you, you've been joining us for a long time or maybe you came during the Christmas season and you want to come back and check out this imperfect church, if that's you, again, just want to say welcome to you. But today, again, we are starting off this brand new series. And for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about relationships, relationships with our spouse, our significant other, relationships with our kids, relationships with our friends, even our relationship with our job. You see, as human beings, we are quick to run to other human beings along with our job in hopes that they will complete us, and yet it never seems to work. We hope to find someone or something that will complete us, and yet that's just not possible. And so as we start off this brand new year with this brand new series, today we're going to talk about expectations and the expectations that we have with others. Now just to say it really, really strongly, not all expectations are are bad. There are some expectations that are actually really good and really healthy and also some expectations that are really, really necessary. Like in your marriage, you can and should expect your spouse to talk about their problems, to talk about their feelings, just like you can expect your husband to help with the kids and it not be called babysitting, okay? At least that's what my wife is trying to convince me of. And speaking of kids, you can and should expect them specifically when they start smelling really, really nasty, to take a shower at least every other day and to change their clothes every single day. We're actually working on the basics right now in the Weber household. Again, some expectations are really good and really healthy and really necessary. 
The same is true with our friends. We can and should expect that our friends won't share personal things with others that we've shared with them. And our job, our boss, can and should expect that we will show up for our job every single day. Once more, expectations are good and healthy and necessary, but then there's the unrealistic side of expectations. Expectations that you and I place on others that are completely unrealistic. And we do this with our friends, we do it with our, with our parents, we do it with our spouse, we do it with our job. And just to say it, an unrealistic expectation is any time that you and I, any time that we look to fill our needs through others, that they were never meant to fill. Again, an unrealistic expectation is any time that we, you and I, look to fill our needs through others that they were never meant to fill. Well, at one point, Jesus was hanging out with a group of his closest friends, the 12 disciples, and he was, he was sharing with them some different things, and he was teaching about this and about that. When his friend, one of the 12 disciples, Peter, came up to Jesus and began to ask Jesus about forgiveness, and he asked the question, how many times should you forgive another person? Well, in response to Peter's question, Jesus began to share a story with Peter and the group of disciples about a certain man about a certain man. And picking up this story halfway through the story, here is what Jesus says in response. Jesus says the man went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put into prison until the debt could be paid in full. Again, Jesus is talking about a man here who has a fellow servant that owes him a few thousand dollars. And so the man goes and he finds this servant and he basically tells the servant, pay me what you owe me. Pay me what you owe me. And he grabs the fellow servant by the throat. And even though the servant is pleading with him, just give me a little more time. He has the fellow servant put into prison, arrested, until the debt can be paid in full. Now, just as we said, Jesus is talking in a story here about forgiveness, but in a very similar way, this gives us the perfect picture of what it looks like whenever you and I put an unrealistic expectation on another person. Jesus is talking about forgiveness, but it also gives us the perfect picture of whenever you and I put an expectation on someone else that they were never meant to fill. And in, internally, when we do this, internally what we're saying to the other person is this, pay me what you owe me. Pay me what you owe me. Whether we agreed on the expectation or not, whether I just assumed that you would do something or that you wouldn't do something, whenever you do not meet my expectation, pay me what you owe me. Pay me what you owe me. We do this in marriage. There's the subtle expectation that our spouse is going to make us happy that our spouse is gonna make us fully loved. We expect that our spouse is gonna fill all of our needs, at least most of them, and when they don't live up to our expectations, what happens? We're filled with bitterness and resentment, jadedness, pay me what you owe me. We do this with our kids as well. There's the expectation that our kid is gonna be everything that we weren't. Our kid is never going to embarrass us. Instead, they're always going to make, uh, make us proud. At the very least, our kid is going to listen to what we say. How's that going for you, parents, right? And when they don't listen to what we say, what do we do? We nag them and we criticize them and we push them. Pay me what you owe me. Pay me what you owe me. We do this with our friends. We expect that our friends will always be there for us like we've tried to always be there for them. We expect that we're always going to have fun together, just like everyone else's groups of friends have fun together and they post it all over Instagram. We have this weird expectation of our friends that they're going to be able to read our minds, that they're always going to help us out. And when they don't help us out, pay me what you owe me. Pay me what you owe me. We do this with other people. We also do this with our jobs these crazy expectations with our job. We're gonna find the dream job, right? That is so dreamy, it's gonna fill us with purpose. 
And our job is always gonna take care of us the same way that we've taken care of it. And our job is gonna use all the amazing, awesome talents that our mom says we have, right? (laughs) And right out of the gate, our job is gonna pay us and pay us and pay us some more. And when it doesn't, pay me. Pay me what you owe me. Pay me what you owe me. Whether it's our job or another person, we expect that someone or something will complete us. And yet once more, that's completely unrealistic. I I just gotta ask, have you ever met someone that just kinda walks around that it almost seems like the world owes them something? Ever met someone like that? It's just like they're, just like they're entitled to everything. It's just like they just kind of expect the world from, from everyone and everything. Maybe you got a family member like this. It's just like they're impossible to please and the expectations that they have on you are completely insane. This is a safe place. Did anyone want to body slam a family member over Christmas? Okay, in the name of Jesus as always, right? But seriously though, have you ever met someone who expects the world of their spouse And secretly you're like, thank God I'm not married to that person. They expect the world of their boss, of their coworkers, of their waiter at a restaurant. They expect everything to be perfect of their friends. They're almost like debt collectors just walking around expecting, 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 expecting. Pay me what you owe me. Ever met someone like that? Annoying, right? I hate to say it, oftentimes that person is you and I. It's us. Maybe you pictured someone in your brain as I was, I was talking, but I honestly, just to say it, because I, I, I love you, oftentimes it's, it's, it's us. It's, it's all of us. All of us have certain people. For some of us, it's just a few. For others of us, we have all kinds of people that we just kind of expect to make us happy. Expect that they'll listen to us, that they'll do as we say. Expect that they'll, that they'll satisfy us. Expect that they'll do exactly what we want them to do. All of us, we, you and I, we have these expectations on others that they were never meant to fill. And when we do this, slowly but surely, our mentality becomes what? Pay me what you owe me. Pay me what you owe me. So now going back to this man that Jesus tells us about, Again, another guy, another fellow servant owes him a few thousand dollars. I think we'd all agree that he, he should get his money back, right? If you and I offered, like, like you know, borrowed somebody a few thousand dollars, we just kind of naturally expect that they're gonna, they're gonna pay us that, that money back. But now going back to the story, I just wanna share the full story with us. Specifically, I wanna share what happens before this one man goes to his other servant. Check out what Jesus says. Jesus says there was a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with the servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. This was an amount at that time that would have been impossible on every level to repay. He couldn't pay him. So his master ordered him to be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But then the the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. He completely canceled it. Now continuing on to the part of the story that we've already heard. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. In contrast, this is nothing to what he was just let off. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Listen to the exact words that he he says. Does it sound familiar? Be patient with me and I will pay it. He pleaded, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. Hearing the full story changes things, doesn't it? Does anyone else want to go body slam that guy? Even earlier this week when I, when I began to read the story, anger welled, welled up within me. It's like, what is wrong with this guy? 
How could this jerk possibly expect his fellow servant to to repay him of a few thousand dollars when he was just let off this huge expectation of a million dollars? What is wrong with this man? Just like anger, like this is so wrong. What is wrong with him? Now, before you and I go and try and find him and choke hold him ourselves, I just want to zoom in on the story again, and it's something that I've never seen before. Like I've shared, I've always just been angry at this guy for being a jerk, but over Christmas, I was randomly reading through, just for fun, one of my my father-in-law's old seminary books. That's what nerdy pastors do. They read old seminary books from the 1980s. It's awesome. No, it's not, but it was. But, but so I get this book and it was written by this legendary professor that's long since passed and has gone to be with Jesus. Just this legendary professor who was a professor at the school, the seminary that I attended. And, 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 and here was his take on this specific story. Again, I was reading through just for fun and he ends up talking about this exact story. And here's his take and it just completely blew me away. Once more, again, the, the king This man owes the kings millions of dollars, right? He owes them millions of dollars, and yet again, look at what he look at what the man asks and what the man begs of the king. Look at look at what he asks. But the man fell down before his king and begged him, please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Be patient, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. Then, as we know, the man immediately leaves. He finds this guy who owes him a few thousand dollars. And he says to him, pay me what you owe me. But why does he do this though? Why does he do it? Is it just because he's a jerk? Like an ungrateful jerk? Why why does he do it? Get this, why? Because the man still thinks he owes the king. He still thinks he owns the king. And that's why when he leaves the king, he immediately goes and finds the person who owes him because internally he's saying, I just need a little more time. I need a little more money. Where can I get money? There's that servant of mine that has a few thousand dollars that owes me. He still thinks he owes the king and what he misses to hear is that the king does not give him more time. What he doesn't realize, the king does not listen to his requests Instead, he completely takes the expectation away. He completely takes it away. Millions. It is now gone. It's finished. It's over. The king who represents God himself removes the expectation. But once more, the man doesn't fully hear him At the very least, he does not believe the king. He can't believe it. Back to us. If we live each day thinking that others owe us, and they owe us, and they owe us, and pay me what you owe me, and pay me what you owe me, if we live each day, if you live each day thinking that others owe you, you still don't understand that you owe God nothing. If you live each day thinking that others owe you a few pennies, maybe a few hundred dollars, maybe even a few thousand dollars, gasp, right? You still don't understand that you owe God nothing. Millions. Millions. Blew me away. Hear this, the only one who's perfect the only one who could rightfully have crazy high, unrealistic expectations on us, the only one who could say, you need to be perfect, and you need to be perfect, and you better be perfect, and you better live up to what you said, and you better make sure you follow through with your promise, and you need to do this to make me happy, and you need to do this for me to love you, the only one, what does he do? Jesus comes, and he completely fulfills the expectation for us. It is gone. It is finished. It's over. The only one. He fulfills the expectations for us. Today, I just got to believe. 
across campuses and network churches that some of us are here and we've tried our entire lives to meet the expectations of everyone else. And we have tried so hard to be good enough for God And we've tried so hard to be good enough for one of our parents. Maybe our dad is just an impossible man to please. And so we work like a slave for him. We meet the expectation. And instead of saying thank you, your dad just raises a little higher. Maybe some of us here, we just have tried so hard to be good enough for another guy, to be good enough for another girl, to be good enough for for whoever, to be good enough for a person that we don't even know. We've tried so hard that we can't comprehend receiving love without strings attached. We've tried so hard to meet the expectations of everyone else that we can't imagine being good enough without meeting everyone's expectations. And so what do we do? We do the same exact thing to others. And I expect this. And I expect that. And you better follow through. And I expect that. You want to make me happy? This, 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 and this. You want to make me pleased? You want me to love you? You better measure up to the expectation that I have. We put expectations on others that they were never meant to fill. Expectations on others that they are unable to fill even if they tried. Why? Because only God, only God can complete us. Only God can complete us. And when we begin to understand, when we begin to understand that God loves us, that God cares for us, that he's so pleased with us right now, not at the end of this year when we meet all of our resolutions, right now he delights in us. He's overjoyed in us. He sings over us. He just loves us so much. When we begin to understand this, not as a cute Sunday school answer, but when we begin to understand this with our soul, and we, when we begin to understand that this same God He takes all of the expectations and through Jesus, Jesus comes and he fulfills all the expectations for us and they are done, they are finished, they are removed. When we begin to understand this, then we'll begin to know that if you you owe God nothing, if you owe God nothing, people don't owe you anything either. We begin to know that God loves us, that the expectations are fulfilled in Jesus. If you owe God nothing, people don't owe you anything either. And when we begin to know this in our soul, our heart towards others will begin to change. And maybe for the first time, all those unrealistic expectations that we put on our dad, on our spouse, on our friend, on our coworker, on the person who hurt us, slowly we'll begin to take all those expectations off the other person that were never meant to be on them in the first place. And maybe for the first time, we'll begin to love another person, our dad, our wife, our husband, our ex, our son, our daughter who's made so many mistakes. We'll begin to love them for the first time with no strings attached. We'll begin to love them free of all expectations. Today I want to close by just asking two simple questions. First question, who are the people that you've put unrealistic expectations on? Maybe it's a bunch of people, but one or two. Who are, who are the one or two people? Again, maybe a family member, a coworker, a college roommate. Who, like, who, who are those people you've put crazy unrealistic expectations on? Just so you know, that person can't complete you. Yes, it's important to have healthy and, and, and good and necessary expectations. That's absolutely the case. But that person will not complete you. Your spouse, they won't complete you. Your parent won't complete you. Your son, your daughter, they will not complete you. Even if they tried, they won't complete you. 
Who are they? The second question I want to ask, what are the things that you're expecting to find in them that were only meant to be found in God? What is it? Those one or two people. What's the expectation that you've just kind of subtly had or you've held against that person? What is it? The expectation for them to make you feel, like, feel, feel whole? Is it wholeness? Is it to feel finally loved? Maybe for you, it's, it's, it's your job and you're, you're placing the expectation on your job what to finally validate you. If you can make this a certain amount of money, if you can just get to this certain status, if you can just do this accomplishment and get this plaque that will you know, collect dust, what is it? What are the things that you're hoping to find? They will not complete you. Today, my, my hope and prayer for all of us as we step into this brand new year, that the moment we, we, we sense these expectations that we're putting on another person, that God, through the Holy Spirit, would just highlight it, just like what we're trying to do. We're trying to make another person God. They're, they're, they're never going to be God. They're never going to complete us. They're never going to make us whole. In those moments, my hope for us is that we take those expectations off the other person, and what would we do? We'd lay them at the feet of the only one who's able to complete us. His name is Jesus. That daily, sometimes hour to hour, maybe moment to moment, again, I, I put this expectation on this person again that they were never meant to fill. Only you were meant to fill, God. I, I put this expectation again, and it ruined the relationship. It created this grudge. There was this awkwardness, like they owed me something when they really didn't owe me anything. I'm just going to take this expectation off of them, and I'm going to set it where it's only rightfully put, right before you, Jesus, right before you. That's my hope and my prayer. that we just know this in our souls. Let's pray. Gracious Father, Heavenly King, we, we come before you so thankful for who you are. You're a Father who lavishes us with love. Your, your love endures forever. You're a God who's faithful from one generation to the next. We're thankful for your grace, for your mercy, for your patience, which has no end. Basically, God, we're thankful for all the ways that you are so different from us and so different from other human beings. You're the only one who can complete us. God, today across campuses and network churches, even, even that person who listens to iTunes later this week, I pray right now you would meet us. You'd stir our hearts. You'd help us to deal with some emotions we've never dealt with before. And would you just bring it to the surface in us, God? We're trying to replace you with others, our spouse, our, our, our dad, our friend, whatever it is, and it's just not working. It will not complete us. They will not complete us. And so, God, today we take those expectations and we put them at your feet. And we ask that starting today, somehow, some way, supernaturally, you'd begin to make us whole you begin to fill us with your peace. We invite you in, God, and we ask you to fill us with your love. God, some of us are dealing with anger. Would you just, would you just fill us with your gentleness? God, some of us today, we're, we're, we're struggling with self-control. God, would you fill us with your self-control? We just want more of you, God. We want to be complete. We want to be made whole, and that's only found in you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. All of God's people said, Amen.